We're going to switch gears just a little bit and um, focus on gender diversity with our next uh, keynote speaker, who is Dr. Heather Faust Cummings. Uh, she is vice president and center leader of Catalyst Research Center for Equity in Business Development and Leadership. So we're very pleased to have her. Dr. Cummings, Faust Cummings, focuses on understanding the relationships between diversity, corporate governance, and board and firm performance. So as part of the 10th anniversary Catalyst Census of Women Board Directors of the Fortune 500, she profiled the experiences of women board directors of companies that had demonstrated a sustained commitment over time to having a significant proportion of women on the board. Additionally, she examines the role of sponsors in influencing the advancement and retention of senior level and high potential women and men. And she speaks about that frequently. So I look forward to hearing from Dr. Faust Cummings. Thank you. Let's welcome her. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm looking for you. Hi. Welcome. OK, great. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so I enabled the content for it. Okay, because it's going to play a video. I oh. hope. I hope. Okay. <laughs> okay. Terrific. Thank you so much. And is my timekeeper is here? Okay, fantastic. Okay, great. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here today. You know, as a speaker, you always when you uh, find out you're the after lunch <laughs> speaker, you always have a little pause there. But uh, I have to say the energy, no pun intended, in the room is quite good. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today. I am um, a local, although uh, I've worked for Catalyst for almost nine years, and we're headquartered in New York. And I started in our New York office and have moved a couple of times since then. So when, uh, when I was approached about doing this engagement, um, one of the things that there was interest in me talking about was women and clean energy and the clean energy economy and the clean energy sector. And I, I said, I don't know anything about clean energy other than what I read in the paper, right? So what I am an expert in is women and leadership. And so what I want to talk to you about today is uh, stereotypes and how those stereotypes can influence your experiences uh, when you're working with policymakers in government, uh, with colleagues at your corporations, I noted that Lockheed Martin uh, was uh, is one of the sponsors of this fantastic conference, and I have to say that Catalyst each year gives an award to initiatives that have demonstrated that they advance women in the workplace. And Lockheed Martin uh, received the award this past year, along with Kimberly Clark Corporation. So uh, there are companies that are working in this sector that really are committed to developing, advancing, retaining women. And, um, and so I'm so pleased to be able to share some of those experiences with you today. So I want to give you a little bit of background on Catalyst. So we are a nonprofit organization that is member-based. So essentially large multinational corporations and top professional service firms are members of Catalyst, and as a result, we partner with them to try to help them build more inclusive workplaces and advance women at work. Our mission is expanding opportunities for women in business, and our vision is changing workplaces, changing lives. Uh, we have offices in the United States, Canada, Europe, India, Australia, and most recently, Japan. So we are truly a global organization and have been around for more than 50 years working on this issue. And our goal is that 50 years from now, none of us will have jobs, that we will have essentially worked ourselves out of jobs, and that the mission of gender equity and gender parity in the workplace will have been achieved. 
So uh, I will want, I do want to warn you, for those of you uh, in the audience who may be more introverted, I want to share with you that we are going to be doing some audience participation. So I am going to be asking for your feedback. So all of you introverts, take a nice deep breath and get ready to participate with all of the extroverts in the audience too, right? Um, it, takes, it takes both kinds to, to make innovation and productivity and all of those things. I truly value um, that, uh, you know, that dynamic certainly an extrovert myself, but um, I don't think anybody can get a PhD and not have a really healthy dose of introvert in them. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about stereotypes. What are they? So stereotypes are generalizations about the characteristics that distinguish different social groups. So essentially, our brain uses stereotypes as a shortcut. It gives us information, and we try to fit people into boxes, right? So this is what our brain does. Um, one of the, the hitches about stereotypes, though, is that they don't have to be true in order to exist. And so sometimes our brains make assumptions that are incorrect. So um, I'll give you an example of a stereotype. When I was in graduate school, I went to graduate school at Emory University in Atlanta. And I was raised in southeast Tennessee, so uh, not too, too far from home, and um, was on my way to do an interview with a lobbyist for my dissertation. And I was driving down Ponce, Ponce de Leon in Atlanta, for those of you familiar with Atlanta, and I blew a tire, got a flat tire. So I pulled my car over into a gas station parking lot, and I was you know, dressed, I had on a bright yellow dress with black and white trim. I looked kind of like a bumblebee. Um, big black heels. And I went to the back of my car and I began getting the materials out of my trunk to change my tire, um, knowing that I was probably going to be late for the interview, but at least thinking, you know, I've still, I've got to be able to get there. So a, a gentleman approached me and said, hey, would, would you like some help? And, you know, I'm no fool. So I said, absolutely, I would love some help. Um, so he got the tire out of the trunk for me. I had already gotten the jack out. And so anyway, he, he went and he sort of set up things by the, by the front tire where the tire had gone flat. And he, he turned, he squatted down, right? And he turns and he looks up over his shoulder at me and he says, watch and learn, watch and learn. And uh, I looked at him and I said, hey, buddy, the jack's upside down. <laughs> so when I was 15 years old, my dad said, if you're going to drive, you're going to know how to change a tire. And he took me outside, and we rotated the tires on our Ford. So, um, you know, that's an example of a stereotype in action. OK, we're going to see if the magic of technology works today. Oh, the video can't play. All right. Um, how, many have you, how many of you have seen the Always Like a Girl video? I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads, a lot of hands in the room. So I'm going to try to, unfortunately, um, did not test drive this ahead of time. Shame on me. Um, but essentially, what the video shows is um, they have a director, and they have different women and girls coming into the studio um, and they're one at a time on stage, so I would imagine it's quite scary, but there's a director, a woman director, who's sitting there with some equipment surrounding her, and she just says, you know, um, show me what it's like to run like a girl. And invariably, the women go like this. As do the men. Show me how to fight like a girl. So then they have little girls come out onto the stage, and they say, show me what it's like to run like a girl. And the girls go, you know, show me what it's like. What does it mean to run like a girl? It means run as fast as you can. So the difference is, right, between the children who have not yet experienced gender bias and stereotypes, they embrace their power and their strength and the women and the men who come out on stage 
embrace the stereotype. It's on YouTube. All you have to do is Google or, you know, go on YouTube, type in like a girl, and you'll see it. So really powerful example of how stereotypes play out in our daily lives and in the lives of our children. I have two girls, so especially, uh, especially relevant to me. So we're going to do a little audience participation now, and I want to give you the opportunity to tell me some things. When I say, what is a leader? What words come to mind when you think about CEO? If I say CEO, what words come to mind? Anyone? Visionary. Strategic power. Executive. Decisive. Leadership. Successful. Male. Tall. There's been there's studies that have been done on that. Height privilege. Boss. White. Masculine. So these are all great words. So a lot of the words that we used um, really reflected male characteristics. And you know, as as we just heard, um, the representation of women in business leadership is is paltry. It's it's. It's essentially flatlined. I mean, if we were medical doctors, we would have declared the patient dead because for 10 years, there has been no statistical change in the, re in the representation of women board directors or women executive officers in the United States. It's bad. So what is one of the reasons for that? One of the reasons is that when we think of a leader, we think of a man. And this is something that has been established in the psychological literature for decades. So the reality is that when we think of a leader, we think of stereotyp stereotypically masculine attributes. And so some of the colleagues that I work with at Catalyst, many of whom are psychologists, I'm not. I'm trained as a political scientist and have a certificate in women's studies. Uh, so appreciate that policy act, uh, aspect for sure. Um, but we, we said, you know, what can we do to build on this research about, about women being viewed as default leaders? And what we did is we looked at characteristics, and we asked managers to describe characteristics of direct reports. And we surveyed these folks, and we said, what are the characteristics that come to mind, and who is most likely to display these characteristics? And what we found was that managers are more likely to report that men are very good at task-oriented behaviors, and that women are very good at people-oriented behaviors. So words like delegating and influencing upwards, those are stereotypically masculine traits, and that is what managers associated with men. Um, women leaders were viewed as better at supporting, rewarding, mentoring, so more people-oriented behaviors. So literally, when we're thinking about, when managers in the workplace are thinking about women and men leaders at work, they expect women to take care, and they expect men to take charge. So what does that mean? for women in the workplace. What impact does that have? So essentially what stereotypes do is they, they have the potential to lead organizations to overlook really, really good talent because they're looking for the take charge behaviors. And men, they view men as more likely to have those behaviors. They're not necessarily looking for the taking care behaviors, the more supportive behaviors. So organizations can look, overlook really, really good talent. We also know uh, Alice Eagley, very famous scholar in this area, who has done research, who has shown that, in fact, when you do, she did a meta-analytic meta study, when you look at the findings of all these studies on leadership, the reality is that it's very, very difficult to predict the gender of a leader. If, if a leader is described irrespective of gender, so you just describe what a particular leader looks like or how he or she behaves, the chance that you are going to correctly guess that person's gender 
is very, very low. In fact, good leaders have those what we used to call soft skills. And increasingly, companies are valuing those skills that include developing people, supporting people, mentoring, sponsoring. Uh, there's a difference between mentorship and sponsorship. A mentor who is, some, is someone who will talk to you. They may provide you specific coaching advice, help you through specific situations, help you with the juggling act that you're doing between your personal life and your work life. But a sponsor will talk about you. That person will be there to pound the table for you when you are not present. So behind closed doors, when there is an opportunity for a high visibility assignment at work, your sponsor is the person who is championing you and does not back down at the first sign of resistance. When someone says, well, you know, I'm not really sure Heather is the perfect person for that job, that person, your sponsor, does not back down and says, no, you know what, she is the right person for that job and she's the right person because of A, B, and C, and we need to give her that opportunity. Tom Falk, who is the CEO of Kimberly Clark Corporation, talks about this in terms of uh, who took a chance on you and who did you take a chance on. And if every person on your list of who you're taking a chance on looks like you, then we have a problem. So all of these things come into play when we're considering stereotypes in the workplace. The reality is that while stereotypes do exist for men, and they're problematic, I mean, we can all point to instances where we have heard people say to men, man up, be like a man, don't be a sissy. There is a lot of pressure on men to behave in certain ways. However, because by and large, men are in positions of power in organizations and men hold most of the positions of authority in organizations, stereotypes are more likely to be applied to women because lim women are both uh, represented in lower proportion in organizations and they have less positional power. They have, they have lower positions and there are fewer of them in organizations. And so those gender stereotypes tend to um, affect women more than men. Another downside of gender stereotypes is that when people begin to buy into those stereotypes, they become more tolerant of gender inequality. So essentially it's, you know, she deserved it or she doesn't deserve it, you know, whatever it might be, uh, you become more tolerant of behavior uh, when those gender stereotypes are at play. You become more accepting of that inequality. Well, you know, he deserves this job and he has to provide for his family and there's no assumption that the woman has to provide for her family, which certainly given the labor force uh, dynamics in the United States we know is not the case. Uh, half, more than half of managerial and professional occupations in the United States are filled by women. So again, organizations really um, are at great risk these days for overlooking a very uh, good source of talent when they overlook women. So building again on research that we had done in, in the Taking Care and Taking Charge study, we wanted to understand how these stereotypes play out for women in the workplace. What happens, sort of? What, are, what is it that women experience when um, they, what do women experience when they encounter these gender stereotypes in the workplace? And how do those stereotypes play out for women at work? What are the consequences? So what we found was that women largely experience three interrelated but different um, dilemmas in the workplace as a result of gender stereotyping. The first is polarized perceptions. The second is high competence threshold. And the third is they're viewed as competent, but they're disliked. So we'll talk about each of these in turn. So this research was based on content analysis that we did of open-ended survey questions and also interviews with women leaders about their experiences in the workplace. How do you experience stereotypes on, on a daily basis? 
So the first dilemma, polarized perceptions. I'm not, as I said, a psychologist, and to me, polarized perceptions sounds very clinical. It sounds very academic. And so in real terms, what does this mean? We refer to it as the Goldilocks syndrome. So when women behave consistent with gender stereotypes, they're viewed as too soft. And women, when women behave inconsistent with gender stereotypes, they're viewed as too tough, right? Hillary Clinton, perfect example of this. So you really can't win, right? <laughs> so you're caught. Um, the, the subtitle of this is re report is damned if you do, doomed if you don't. And the reality is, is that you have to walk this tightrope between too soft and too hard. And you're expected to be a certain way, but when you are that way, you're penalized for it. And Oftentimes, what we have in corporations today is we have male leaders who are providing coaching advice to women. And the women are saying, you know, I'm having trouble negotiating X or Y, or I'm having trouble making my voice heard or influencing or whatever it might be. And then the man, with all the best intentions in the world, says to her, well, this is what I think you should do. And he provides her with the advice that worked for him. It worked great for him. He's a leader. And then she puts it on, and it doesn't fit. It's not authentic, and she gets penalized for it. I actually was on a panel a few months ago. Uh, a woman from Sapient was talking about the fact that she had received coaching advice that she needed to be you know, tougher and more direct, right? So she gets on this phone call with all of these people from all over the country who she manages, and she implements this new persona, and she said it was a nightmare. She said it literally was the worst call. She became very tough, very demanding, very deadline-driven, like not understanding at all, like all of these things that she had been coached to do. And she said literally within two minutes, she emailed everybody and said, please get back on the line. And they got back on the line, and she just said, you know, I am so sorry. <laughs> You know, I was given some advice, and you know what? It just really didn't work, and I recognized how bad that was. So let's start again, and I'm going to do it the way I've always done it, right? But this is a real, this is actually a really, this happens in the workplace every single day. So women have to negotiate, negotiate this um, dilemma of polarized perceptions. Here are some example quotes that we got when we talked to women in these interviews about their experiences with polarized perceptions in the workplace. So women are caught in a catch-22 regarding leadership. If they're strong, they're seen to be aggressive, and if they work in a more consultative way, they're seen to be weak. I hear from a lot of people, both inside and outside, they have trouble trying to find the balance between being collaborative and being tough. Um, women are very much focused on being liked or being good instead of making harsh and tough decisions. The assumption being that you need to make harsh and tough decisions. Certainly you make tough decisions. I don't know that you make harsh decisions uh, when you're a leader in the workplace. So, second dilemma. Again, got to keep it simple. We call this one the Wonder Woman dilemma. All right, it's the high competence threshold. So essentially, with this dilemma, what women experience is that they not only have to be good, they have to be amazing. They have to be fantastic. And women tell us that they face higher standards than men do in the workplace. And it's a little more subtle in some ways, but that is what women experience, that they feel they have to prove that they can lead and they have to manage these stereotypical perceptions. So one of the ways that Catalyst, over the years, we have a consulting business in addition to the research that we do. One of the, years, uh, one of the ways that we have seen this play out over the years is that we often hear in organizations that men are promoted on potential and women are promoted on performance. So the women actually have to demonstrate that they have the capability, they have to show that they have achieved this goal, whereas men uh, are, are able to have the potential, demonstrate that potential. Now there are some great organizations 
that are working against this dynamic in the workplace. So Baxter Asia Pacific is an excellent example. They decided, Gerald Lima, who is the head of Baxter Asia Pacific pharmaceutical company, announced that he wanted 50-50 representation, gender representation on his leadership team in Asia Pacific. And the way they did it, they can do this in the pharmaceutical sector really easily, there's a competency test. And it's about the drugs and the way the drugs work on the patient. And you have to basically pass that test. And once you pass that test, then you're eligible. You're in a high potential pool. You get developed. You get different opportunities. They also monitor uh, high visibility assignments. So we talk to organizations all the time and we say, do you track who gets the plum jobs in your company, the high profile assignments? A lot of companies don't. And so if you are at a corporation, and you know, we all know what those jobs are. They're the jobs that get you a lot of visibility with senior leaders, has profit and loss experience probably. Um, it might be an international assignment. You know, all of these things. If you look down your list of what were the five hot jobs in my company this year or the 10 hot jobs in my company this year, and if every single person on that list, if each one of those jobs had a man filling that slot, then that's a problem. And if you're not tracking... Who's getting those jobs? That's a problem. So you have to be very aware of those types of things. And they're easy, they're easy to do, and they're common sense. And people go, gosh, you know, why didn't we think of that? It's hard to look at your numbers. It's really hard. We, had, uh, we have research on high potentials. And uh, we have a board of advisors at Catalyst that's made up of C-suite uh, individuals, not necessarily CEO, but C-suite individuals. They may be heading business units of huge, huge companies. I mean, these are enormous corporations. And uh, we talked to them about our research findings that show we, we took data from 26 global business schools, graduates, MBA graduates, and we looked at it. And we found out that women start from behind and they stay behind over the course of their careers, both in level and in wage. So that wage gap over time grows tremendously. So we presented those report, uh, results to our board of advisors. And there were just some heads in the board boardroom going, you know, not at my company. No, that is not the case at my company. But you know what? To their credit, they went back to their companies and they said to HR, I want to see the titles and the salaries at these levels. And they did a comparison. And sure enough, across business units, the men were being paid more than the women. And when you looked at, and you know, the first explanation was, well, you know, the competencies are different. You know, the competencies are a little different between these two lines of business. No, actually, they weren't. So they actually made pay adjustments, and they made sure that there was equity in title and there was equity in pay. But this is not easy work. You know, people don't want to necessarily see the warts exposed. It's hard. It's hard work. So for this high competence threshold, let me give you a couple of quotes about how uh, this plays out in the workplace for women. So one British man said, it still seems more difficult for women to achieve leadership positions. Therefore, those that do are normally, on average, better than men. Uh, a US woman said, I think it's a real challenge because every day we're held up to a higher standard constantly. Every day, daily interaction is building the persona of that individual, that female executive. So unfortunately, you do need to be aware of the things you're doing and how it will be perceived by other people. So it's hard. It's certainly hard to be a, a corporate leader um, when stereotypes are working against you. So for those of you who remember the slide where I outlined the three, uh, the three dilemmas, you know, you see competent but disliked, right? The black widow. So this one, um, you know, she's competent, but stay very, very far away. And we see this play out all the time that um, women are generally perceived as either competent or as likable, but rarely both. It's very difficult for them to be perceived in as both effective in their jobs and effective interpersonally. So let's share a, uh, let's hear some quotes from folks on this particular dilemma. So in my experience, women leaders are held to a double standard of being competent and having to be liked in order to fit. Men are not expected to be likable. Intelligent and problem-solving women leaders are often hindered by their own ego, a German middle manager. 
Uh, when, women are wonderful multitaskers, which can be intimidating to some people. And as a result, women who are very committed and very focused on what needs to get done come across as being a hard ass, or some men like to call it a B-I-T-C-H. Now, I don't know, I, you know, I'm going to date myself here, but, you know, for me, this is the one that calls to mind Hillary Clinton. And the reason is many of you will recall Barbara Bush in an interview saying, I think probably to Barbara Walters, you know, she's a word and it rhymes with witch. W-I-T-C-H, not the W-H-I-C-H. <laughs> no, you know what I mean. Like, you've got um, the former first lady saying of Hillary Clinton, you know, she's a word, but it rhymes with this. And so it's very, very difficult for women to negotiate that double bind, this double bind of both being competent and being liked. Um, and so... Certainly, I think um, women have their work cut out for them. So in sum, we have these three dilemmas for, for women. Polarized perceptions, you know, the, the finding the balance between taking care and taking charge can be really difficult. We have the Wonder Woman standard. You know, once you're in, you have to continue to prove over and over and over again that you deserve to be there. Um, or we have the black widow spider, or spider. So you may be great at results, but you're perceived as toxic. And the B word comes into play. Women sometimes need to be labeled. I mean, this research, uh, some of us at lunch were talking about Rosabeth Moss Cantor's work. I mean, this was, this, that Women and Men of the Corporation was published in 1977, and she was talking then about the words that were used to label women in the workplace. Uh, unfortunately, we, we haven't necessarily come uh, too particularly far in that. I don't know how many of you saw the article in Forbes, uh, it was Forbes or Fortune, about uh, the word abrasive. Did anyone see this? So the word abrasive, they did content analysis of performance reviews. The word abrasive is often used to describe women, but it's never used to describe men. One of my colleagues was working at Duke Corporate Education, and she said she was working with a client, and, um, and the client this executive team, essentially, that she was working with, um, were doing succession planning. And they were talking about high potential leaders who could be the next generation of talent for the C-suite in the organization. And um, when women, the names of women would come up in the discussion, invariably, one of the men would say, she lacks gravitas. <laughs> she doesn't have gravitas. So essentially, they banned the word gravitas. So then the men began saying, she lacks executive presence. She doesn't have executive presence. So um, some code words that come into play, unfortunately, in these cases. So um, I would love to give you all the opportunity. Uh, we will have opportunity for Q&A. But I would love to hear from some of you about your reactions, whether or not you've experienced stereotypes in the workplace, whether you're all asleep from those amazing chocolate-covered strawberries that I had a couple of. Um, everybody wake up and give me some opinions about what you're seeing in business, um, what the future holds. You know, I have been um, told that this is kind of a downer, <laughs> like this whole thing is kind of a downer. So I don't want it to just be a downer. I want, I want to give you those bright spot examples where companies are doing really, really well. But I also want to arm, especially the younger women in this room, I want to arm you with information so that you're prepared. I literally, you know, encountered... Uh, very recently, the beginning of August, I was in an academic conference, and I was confronted with the most blatant sexism, the most sexist comment, and I have been a feminist for a very long time, and I have been studying women since I was in college, and I was totally flat, I was caught totally flat-footed, I had no idea what to say, and if, if that's my experience, where I work on gender every single day of my life, where I will not eat at the Cheesecake Factory because they have no women on their board, and other kids are saying to my girls, oh, you know, we went to the Cheesecake Factory, and my 11-year-old's you know, going, oh, my mom won't let us eat at the Cheesecake Factory because they don't have any women on their board. <laughs> so I'm like, come on, Cheesecake Factory, please add some, some women to that board. Um, but... Uh, but this is true. So if you're in the workplace and you're experiencing this, I want you to be thinking about these things because I want you to be prepared for the fact that they exist and the fact that you need to be able to have some strategies to respond to them. So let's take just a couple of minutes for some audience feedback, and then I'm going to give you some strategies that we have 
compiled and see uh, maybe they resonate with some of what you're experiencing. Thank you so much for getting the mic. Hi. And please say you. who you are and where you're from. I'm Britt Eide, and I serve as one of the ambassadors for C3, and I'm from Boise, Idaho. And I have definitely experienced many of these, if not all of them. Um, and especially challenging in a more conservative community, and I'm sure others who are from different states appreciate that. So um, I have to admit, I was feeling the, the Debbie Downer feeling like, okay, <laughs> would you please just get to the what we can do next part? Yes. So I'm looking forward to your strategies. And Good. I think what I just want to highlight to people who are here for the first time especially is that this is an amazing place to make those connections and have resources to reach out for people when you do have these issues or you're trying to figure out how to deal with it. It helps so much to have this you know, camaraderie network of women. And I want to make sure you do have time to talk about all the amazing things you Catalyst is doing to change this for the companies yes. who aren't members, like yes. the Cheesecake Factory. I know 2020 Women on Boards works with that. That's a yes. really neat thing that everybody can do. It's a once a month email. It's super easy. So I hope you'll do a pitch for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Lots of hands. Yes. Hi, I'm Barb Berger. I uh, work for Chevron. So I have a question for you relative to these um, uh, perceptions, and, and we've all probably heard them, and the Forbes article said even women giving the performance reviews use the same language. Yes. So we're all part of this world. Is And so what do you do with executives to get them to be aware that the paradigms or stereotypes are being played out? Because you have to, at some point, you have to believe that people are trying to do the right thing. Yes, right? absolutely. So how do you get them to know it's not about the individual and you're falling into the trap? Right, exactly. So Catalyst, has, we use this phrase at Catalyst all the time in our, in our own interactions with coworkers, assume positive intent. So everybody should take that back to their workplace. Assume positive intent. Oftentimes, people are not, they're not out to get you. Um, Catalyst has done, I just want to nip this question in the bud because it's going to come up that women, you, you sort of raised it, but you know that women are harder on other women than they are on other people. Catalyst has actually done research. It's called the myth of the queen bee. Um, women are far more likely to help other women in the workplace than men are. Um, they mentor more women than men do. Um, and I wish we could just kill that um, perception. But it's hard because individual women have had experiences with other individual women and it hasn't necessarily been positive, and so then we, we extrapolate that and we generalize it to the population as a whole, but in fact, um, statistically speaking, and um, the, the broad experience is that that is not the case. So one of the ways, um, there are some companies doing some really innovative things around this. Lockheed Martin actually is, um, not that I'm gonna just commercial for Lockheed Martin all day long, um, they're not the only one. Catalyst actually has some great research that we've done in partnership with um, Rockwell Automation, and when I say in partnership with, Rockwell Automation is our lab. Um, they've been very generous in allowing us to go in, to survey their employees, to do focus groups with their employees. But both Lockheed and, um, and uh, Rockwell Automation are using a group called White Men as Full Diversity Partners. And that's their name, WMFDP, White Men as Full Diversity Partners. And they go in and they do trainings. Um, they have a white man's caucus and they have a white men and allies learning lab. And I heard it in the room. People went, ooh, when I said white men's caucus. They are upfront about what they do. They go in, and they do workshops, and they teach white men that they have a race, that they have a gender, and that their experience is not necessarily the experience of everyone else in their organization. And Rockwell is building it from the bottom up. Lockheed Martin put over 500 managers through that training. And so if you are a woman, if you're a person of color, you still get to go through the training with other white men. You go through the white men and allies learning labs. The white men's caucus tends to be the executive committee, right? Because so many of those executive committees are just white men. Um, so anyway, this. That's one tool that companies are using. We're also seeing a lot, a lot of work and a lot of interest in unconscious bias training right now. And I will say that we, you have to be careful because studies have shown, in fact, that if you don't teach people the strategies, <laughs> that you actually, it can become worse. And so unconscious bias training has to be done in a very effective way. But there are also studies that showed simply by recognizing 
that you as a person and every single one of us in this room has biases and we enact them on a daily basis. To your point, the fact that women use the word abrasive to describe other women. Sharp elbows. That's another one we hear a lot. You know, she has sharp elbows. Has anybody ever heard somebody describe a man as having sharp elbows? Um, so we see this. We see this all the time. You can simply, by being aware, interrupt your biases. And so even though deep down in your heart of hearts, you may be biased, you can interrupt that bias. So a great example um, of this, too, is at McDonald's in Japan. Um, many of you know that women's representation in the workforce in Japan is very, very low. It's very low. But Prime Minister Abe, um, Ambassador Kennedy, there are a lot of people working very hard on this issue of trying to get more women into the workforce uh, into the workforce in Japan. And Harada-san, who leads um, McDonald's in, in Tokyo, has said, you know, we recognize that we are within a larger culture in this country that not, is not necessarily fully accepting of women at work and women ascending to positions of power at work. But we at McDonald's have a culture that believes in women's leadership. And so we at McDonald's are going to develop women leaders within the culture of Japan, but we internally are going to develop women. So those are some ways that companies are actually working to interrupt those things. I know we have several other comments, and we do still have time for Q&A at the end. So I'm going to take a question here and here and here. I'm going to start back in the back. Do you have a mic? No. You do. Yes. Hi. Mine, mine was um, experience with some of these gender stereotypes. Um, my name's Emily. I had a long-term consulting engagement, um, and I had my first child this past November. Um, so I took some time off from my consulting engagement and did something that I could do from home in the meantime. And when it came time to talk with, my, um, with the people who I had consulted with, um, middle-aged white men, um, about coming back on board, the work that they were offering me was very different from the work that I'd had before. And I said, well, you know, I, I'd really like to go back to doing what I was doing before, which I was very effective at. And the response was, well, are you sure that you could handle that right now? And I gave him an example of the work that I'd been doing in the interim and the results I'd been getting and got kind of a sort of mumbled, sheepish response. And, and I think that that's I'm sure that there are a lot of, I see nodding heads about, you know, we have to, and my husband would never have gotten asked that question at his work. There was no question that he would continue doing the same sort of work he'd always been doing. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you for sharing. Yep. Yes, here. Um, Cindy Johnson, I'm an ambassador of here, I live in Washington, D.C., and uh, 10 years ago I served as senior vice president of a company list on the New York Stock Exchange and I was the only woman in the C-suite. And it was an interesting experience because the next woman below me was 2,000 people down. And when I first took the job, uh, the secretaries and everybody would you know, sort of tackle me in the elevator and say, God, thank God you're here. And <laughs> um, at any rate, it was a challenge. And, but I feel like that was 10 years ago. I went to a Western institution on the other coast and went to their graduate school for 10 days and took uh, negotiation and influence strategies. So I just want to say to all the younger women in this room, take negotiation and influence strategies wherever you can find it, however you can do it. And I found that let me as a woman really turn the guys on their ears. Mm -hmm. And I used my femininity. I, I occasionally would even call myself a dumb blonde and then ask a really impossible question. But I just want to make everybody know um, you can do it. And I, I actually feel like we're a little bit past it. I mean, we have Marilyn Euston from Lockheed Martin and, and you know, I mean, phenomenal, yes. this extraordinary yes. CEO. We have Mary Barra battling at GM with all these recalls. There's some extraordinary women CEOs out there right now. And I think that, you know, they've come through these last 10 years. So I'm just here to give a hell roaring cry to everybody who's younger. You can do it. And I know we'll have more CEOs in 10 years. And thank you. I hope so. Okay, last question in the back, and then we'll go to uh, a broader Q&A. We'll get you when we start Q&A. 
Hi, I'm Linda Silverman from the Department of Energy. Um, I just have an anecdote from the 90s about how you can use a gender stereotype and, um, and really turn a, a, a senior manager's um, head. So I um, used to work at the US Trade Representative, and at one point in time, there was um, a delegation of just women negotiators going to Korea. And um, apparently, the men that they were dealing with in Korea were so disarmed by these women that they basically gave every concession to the US. <laughs> and we, so we totally killed on that one. And, um, and then I was in a situation where I, would, you know, I work at Energy, and I had an opportunity to go to the Middle East, and my, my wonderful male sponsor, he said, oh, I don't think you can go. You know, like, I don't, you know, you're a woman, and da, da, da. So I said to him, you know what? The US government can never buy into this gender stereotype. And then I explained to him what happened in Korea, and I said, if anything, you should be sending all women to these <laughs> countries because, you know, we got every concession we wanted and more. Yeah. Um, and he, um, he thought about it overnight, and he came in the next morning. He said, I did not sleep a wink. <laughs> I am so mortified by my reaction. I cannot believe I did that. And that was it. I mean, he changed his tune 100, 180% for all women in our organization. So, you know, I, I think we, sometimes I think gender stereotypes can help. Right, right. Yeah, it's, um, I love these anecdotes. It's great. Um, if you ever talk to anybody from CH2M Hill, which is a construction and engineering firm, the current CEO, Jackie Rast, came out of negotiate, negotiation and Catalyst, uh, when we do the Catalyst Award, we don't just, it's not like you fill out a survey and then we declare a winner. We actually go on site to the company at our expense. We interview and do, folk, we do interviews, we do focus groups with employees at all levels in the organization, all nationalities, races, race, ethnicity, LGBT status, you name it. Um, if it's important to the company's business and it has to do with their initiative that they've nominated, we talk to people. And I remember being on site at CH2M Hill and uh, an executive vice president saying to me, Jackie was at the time and, and also an executive vice president, Jackie Rast is the best negotiator that we have at CH2M Hill and she's now the CEO. So it's, it, it's, these are great stories and there are plenty of bright spots out there for us to leverage and and to take, um, to take both lessons from and also inspiration from. Okay, so let's get to the things that you really wanna talk about, which is strategies for addressing these dilemmas. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you some individual strategies, but then I'm gonna tell you why I want you to really not rely on individual strategies and rely instead on organizational strategies. All right, so individual strategies for uh, addressing this. Acknowledge the elephant in the room. I was talking to a woman yesterday who said that she was, in, same thing, confronted with a very sort of sexist, um, stereotypical response from somebody. And she is somebody who is, while she's in a line role in a, in a very large company, and it's a tech company, um, she's also working on diversity and inclusion initiatives within the firm and with, within the company. And she, she like encountered this remark and went back to the guy and was like, look, you know, I'm doing this diversity and inclusion work and I've been reading these case studies and you, it, like that situation, I'm now a, in that chapter. Like we, it's like reading a chapter of a book or reading a case study and now you and I are the protagonists in this case study. So you can do it in a way that is not accusatory and not pointing your finger and how dare you um, your use of the, you know, the U.S. government cannot buy into these stereotypes. It's direct. It's honest. It's true. It's smart. You can address them at an individual level, bring up the subject. Sometimes people don't want to talk about sensitive subjects, so the elephant in the room. But you can be direct and, and successful in managing that. Another strategy is being visible. So um, when... There, there is a um, psychological phenomenon where you can accommodate exceptions to the rule. So you may have a theory or a stereotype. You may hold a stereotype about a particular group of people, but you may know one person that doesn't fit that stereotype and you have great affection for and affinity for this person, and yet you don't lump them in that stereotypical category. But what happens is the more and more people that begin to break that stereotype for you, you can no longer hold the stereotype, right? It's cognitive dissonance. Eventually, you're, it's going to break down. 
So if you, in your firms and in your companies, can be visible and show great success, then that will help break down these stereotypes. Um, another thing you need to do is, is communicate. People do not, you know, for the most part, Long Island medium aside, people are not mind readers, right? You know, we don't, we don't read people's minds. We don't call people up from the dead to know what someone else is thinking, whatever. Um, you need to be clear with people about what it is that you want. If you want a stretch assignment, ask for a stretch assignment. If you feel like the thing that's really holding you back at work is your lack of P&L experience, then ask for a profit and loss job. Ask for a P&L role. If you feel like you need to do a stint in HR because you're all technical, which probably the women in this room, right? You're really heavy duty on the science side or the te technical side, but you don't necessarily have the personal leadership skills, then go do a rotation or a stint. Ask for a rotation. Ask for an international assignment. Ask for you know whatever it might be and talk to your sponsor about what, are the, what is it that I need to do? Um, one of the things that we often hear at Catalyst is that men are afraid to give women tough feedback because they are afraid that the women will cry. And um, you know what? Sometimes some of us cry at work. I mean, I like to say that crying is a tool in my toolbox, right? Sometimes I pull it out. Um, you know, the reality is, is if I'm having a really bad day because some other part of my life is off kilter, one of my kids, you know, my husband and I had an argument, you know, something's wrong with my mom or my brother or, you know, any vast, you know, the laundry list that we all carry around every day. And I loved the, uh, the comment earlier about, you know, living a complicated life. We all live complicated lives. Um, if that's the day, if things are going wrong on one of those fronts or more than one of those fronts, and that's the day that I have to have a courageous conversation at work or my boss has to give me tough feedback, I might cry. But that doesn't mean that I'm incompetent. It doesn't mean that I'm not committed. It doesn't mean that I'm stupid. It doesn't mean that I'm lousy at my job. It doesn't mean that I should be fired or need to quit. It just means I'm having a bad day or a bad moment in an otherwise OK day. Um, so tell your boss that you want to hear the tough feedback because the thing that will hold you back the most is not getting the tough feedback that you need in order to advance. And so tell, just be, you know, straight up, I need to hear the tough feedback because if I don't know what I don't know, I can't fix it. I can't work on it. I can't build it. All right. Another thing that you can do is you can minimize the issue. You can reframe it or adapt it. Um, I will caution you that studies have shown that using humor makes you appear that people judge you as less competent when you use humor to deflect situations. So it depends on your personality. If you're a person who routinely is able to use humor, then it probably will work and people won't see you as less competent. But if you're someone who is not known for your humor, and then you try to make a joke, um, that, that may not go over well. All right, so the reason why we hesitate to um, offer, I mean, individual strategies can be successful, and one-on-one, -on -one they may work beautifully. The risk of that is we don't want organizations to think that the problem lies with the woman, and we don't want to be about fixing the woman we want to be about fixing the workplace. We want to be about organizations fixing themselves and creating cultures that values talent in all shapes, sizes, and forms. So that caution um, being given, um, there are some things that organizations can do, and we certainly have talked about some of those today. You can identify and address stereotypes, right? You can certainly do unconscious bias training in your corporations. Your HR representatives, and you can actually even do this on your own, go through your performance review form at work and see whether or not there's any biased language. Is there any language that skews, like a lot of stereotypical male terms, like is it all about being strong and aggressive and assertive? And if those are the competencies or the behaviors by which you're evaluating your employees, you probably need to take a look at your performance review documents themselves. As a manager, look at the ratings that you're giving employees and look at the language that you're giving employees, that you're using with employees. Are you holding men and women to different standards? Are you using different words for women and men? 
Um, lastly, hold, um, hold, account, hold managers accountable for bias. If you see that there is a manager who is um, you know, beneath you in the organizational hierarchy who is consistently rating women lower than rating men, then you need to take a look at that. Uh, and certainly you can provide employees with resources and tools to address these stereotypes. Okay, I do have a couple of case studies that actually um, I'm not gonna go through because we're running short on time and I wanna make sure we get back to Q&A and I know we had a question here at this table, the woman in the black dress. Yep. Um, and then other questions if we have them. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rose McKinney James and I'm one of the ambassadors uh, hailing from Las Vegas and I have the privilege of actually serving on a Fortune 500 board. Awesome. And so I want to give you a shout Yay. out. Yes. <laughs> I want to give you the shout out because when our CEO came back from some meeting that Catalyst sponsored, <laughs> he suddenly turned to our governance committee and decided that he needed to advance gender equality. And we went from two women to now three. Hey, fantastic. And are poised to do more. But I guess it would be helpful and it's not in the energy space, but we do have a sustainability component. It would be helpful to have you explain a little more about uh, beyond the uh, analytics, yes. really what Catalyst uh, does to help in that regard. Sure, I'll be happy to do that. So um, thank you very much for that shout out, by the way, and I wanna talk to you later because I'm doing a study. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to be able to get access to, you, to some of your board directors in those conversations. Um, so as I mentioned, Catalyst has been around for uh, 50, more than 50 years, 52 years almost. And it was founded by Felice Schwartz literally at her kitchen table in Ohio. And um, she was a very, very accomplished woman who um, could not get back into the workplace after the birth of her first child. So that's sort of how we started off, um, helping individual women and trying to help them get back into the workforce. And over time, we have evolved from an organization that tries to help individual women to an organization that helps organizations. And so we have a board of directors, we have a board of advisors, and then we have over 700 members across the globe who um, turn to us for advice, consulting, resources, um, connections to other companies that are doing things well. Um, for advice. And one of the things that we do is we have a Catalyst Corporate Board resource. And so we uh, invite member company CEOs to nominate board-ready women. And so it's um, marrying the research that we've done on sponsorship and our CEOs and marrying that concept to say, you know what, we know women are underrepresented on boards. We know that sponsorship works, sponsorship matters. If someone is doing a board search and they see that this woman has the stamp of approval of, you know, insert high profile CEO here, has that stamp of approval, it takes some of that feeling of risk out of the situation. Um, we do sponsor events. So for example, last December, we had a CEO summit that was focused on the issue of diversity, gender diversity on boards. And we had about um, 35 CEOs and two of their direct reports. The way we run that is that we ask the CEO to bring two direct reports with him, one of whom must be a woman. I say him, but it could be a her. We have Maggie Wilderotters on our board, Denise Morrison, some other, some really high profile women CEOs as well. But essentially, we're trying to break down those barriers, working hand in hand with companies. It's not all about the executive level. It's not all about the C-suite or about boards. We also, as I mentioned, our research on high potentials in the pipeline. We look at women all the way down through corporations. We have some research coming out in partnership with um, a couple of academic scholars who, um, who have analyzed our data in combination with some EEO data to show whether or not there's a relationship between the presence of women at the top and women further down in the organization. Catalyst has done some of that research and we find, you know, because people are like, oh, you know, boards, like, you know, they're so esoteric, they're, it's only people at the very elite level, there's not that many. Our research has shown that the presence of women on the board level drives more women executive officers. So if you look at the relationship over, you know, five years later, you're more likely to have women executives if you have women on your board. So um, it's time for me to end. I so appreciate you having me here today. I hope that um, it wasn't just all Debbie Downer. 
<laughs> and that you um, learn some things and will able, be able to take back some lessons to your organizations. Thank you so much for the opportunity.